New York City might be the public transit capital of the United States, but its streets still look like this. Each day, the city plays host to an intricate dance of pedestrians, cyclists, and vehicles. In fact, 27% of the city's total landmass is dedicated to streets, a far greater percentage than even infamously car-heavy Los Angeles. New York just has more of everything, right? There's more, more, more pedestrians, more traffic, more trucks, more cyclists, more bus riders than anywhere else. We have 8 million people who just live here, but more visit. And everybody who steps on the city street needs a safe road. Keeping on top of repairs, traffic management, cleaning, and adjustments for bike or bus lanes is a 24-7 Sisyphean task, ever necessary and never-ending. Recent movements to minimize private cars in favor of bikes, buses, and walking have gained support. But regardless of what modes of transit fill them, streets won't become any less critical to keep the city running smoothly, or as smoothly as can be expected. It's our responsibility to deliver streets that are safe, that whether you're walking, biking, driving, taking a motorized unicycle, that you are safe on those streets. Here's how New York keeps hustling and bustling by maintaining, managing, and reimagining its roads. If it's leaf season, we could pick up like five loads that we'll have to dump. On a regular day, we usually done maybe twice a day. Once before lunch, once at the end of the day. It just looks like it's just blowing everything all over the place. I mean, that's the impression people get when they see it's coming. I'll be honest with you, before I was on this job, I used to think the same thing. I used to see it going by, and I'd be like, is that actually yeah, even doing power anything? Power. A fleet of mechanical brooms like these work year-round to collect trash that lands in the streets. Bottles, bodega receipts, dollar slice pizza crusts, you name it. So if sanitation workers like Chris weren't constantly patrolling the streets? What the city would be like, it would be filth out there. People come to the city from all over the world, to New York City. They want to see a clean city. They don't want to be walking around in filth. This asphalt jungle didn't always require this level of effort to maintain because, well, it didn't exist for most of the city's history. Dutch settlers established loose traffic rules, no galloping your wagons, carts, or sleighs in the city, and either they or the subsequent English settlers created the city's first paved road in the 17th century. Stone Street, originally paved with actual cobbles, is today a popular downtown bar scene. But for most of the next 200 years, chaos reigned. By the mid-19th century, horses, carriages, and pedestrians jostled for space on the city's roads, which, if they were paved at all, were done so with a disorganized hodgepodge of materials. Finally, after the Civil War, one substance, ancient in origin but made new by the Industrial Revolution, began to spread. And today, well, just look around. My boss likes to say that we bother everybody <laughs> and we also serve everybody. Bicyclists, pedestrians, cars, vehicles, buses, everybody needs a smooth road, a safe road. And that's what we do here. This is the Hamilton Avenue asphalt plant in Brooklyn. Since 1979, it has prepared and distributed asphalt for the borough. There is a unit at DOT that rates every single street in New York. And we divvy up the resurfacing in each borough according to the ratings on the street. We try to hit locations that are most prone to potholes because a real solution to potholes is a resurfaced street, the good rate. It's uh, pretty much like baking a cake. You got all the ingredients, you put all the right ingredients together, you mix it, and you know, through the technology, um, we're using up to 45% of the recycled asphalt. Yes, the spirit of recycling in the city includes its streets. Older asphalt comes alive again in a sort of urban circle of life. 
recycle almost 400,000 tons of used asphalt a year. So after the truck leaves here, it goes to a paving site. Now, we have 15 crews who work throughout the city. During the period of time between March and December, they work day and night. We have five night crews, and that allows us to pave a lot of hard to resurface locations. The city's transformation from dusty mess to asphalt jungle may seem inevitable in hindsight, but it actually happened largely at the behest of a single man. Robert Moses is a complicated figure. No magic will suddenly produce roads commensurate with cars. We have fallen far behind. Urban planner Robert Moses was the most influential person over New York City's physical environment in the 20th century. Despite never winning any sort of elected position, Moses transformed the city into the network of car-friendly highways we know today. But especially for a city that now seeks to mitigate the harm of too many personal vehicles, Moses' legacy is complicated. He certainly did a lot of good for the city in building, building parks and building you know, infrastructure that we still rely on. But there's a tremendous legacy of, of highways and neighborhood impacts that you know, are, continue to burden communities, and particularly communities of color and lower income communities to this day. Moses directed the construction of 627 miles of roads in and around New York City, including several bridges and 32 expressways and parkways. But to do so, he raised entire neighborhoods, most of them inhabited by lower-income people of color, displacing some quarter of a million people. Additionally, Moses created infrastructure that heavily favored cars over buses and subways. He blocked public access to several bridges, vetoed the Second Avenue subway twice, and allegedly built overpasses too short to accommodate city buses. Moses continued his projects until the 1960s, but the subsequent 60 years of infrastructure in New York have been defined by maintaining and managing his life's work. So we are in the Traffic Management Center in Long Island City, Queens. This is where we monitor traffic conditions all around the city and where we operate the traffic signal system throughout the five boroughs. So we have 13,500 signalized intersections out of about 40,000 intersections in total. We're monitoring on over 800 city DOT cameras and then we have access to an additional 300 state DOT cameras and they all communicate back here where our team can monitor the health of the traffic signals themselves, make sure they're working properly, and then also monitor traffic conditions, make adjustments on the fly. All these traffic lights operate on timers set to anywhere between 45 and 120 seconds, depending on typical traffic conditions in the area. And while much of what appears on all these cameras is car traffic, Benson and his team are prepared for a future where transit may look different. You know, the more people that get around in other ways, the less wear and tear that is on our road, the less risk that is for people out there. Those types of changes are definitely positive as, as we go forward. One major change taking place in the city is making way for different types of transit, especially cycling. I first hopped on a bike in New York when I was seven years old. That would be 1956. So I've been doing this a while. In some ways, it's easier to bike now because you do have the infrastructure. The volume of traffic has just increased exponentially. Steve Schofield has been a volunteer with the Ghost Bike Project since 2011, an organization that memorializes sites of cyclist fatalities. It's there for the families for all of us to make drivers and everybody aware that it's, you know, it's a hard world out there, but cyclists are vulnerable and that there, but for the grace of whatever, that could be a bike for me. Total pedestrian and cyclist fatalities and injuries due to cars have steadily fallen since the 1990s, but that still amounts to thousands of injuries and hundreds of deaths annually. Right now you have these large metal behemoths frequently with just one person in them. And right now, cars 
own most of the street. There's a limited amount of space, and nobody wants to give an inch. Throughout the entire history of the city, it's really been a city for people that walk and bike and take public transit. Cars have occupied such a narrow sort of slice of that multi-hundred year history in the city. And we really just want to rebalance the streets to meet the needs of everyone. So taking away just ever so slightly a little bit of space away from cars and adding more bike lanes, pedestrian plazas, street seats, open streets, um, all the great things that are within our, our toolkit. In April 2020, Shortly after the COVID-19 pandemic severely restricted New Yorkers' ability to move about freely, the city's Department of Transportation launched the Open Streets program. Each weekend, residents come together on two blocks on 31st Avenue in Astoria, Queens. Its use left up to the whims of the community. Astoria is very proud of the community that's built here. Um, we really treat the 31st Ave as the front yard of the, the neighborhood in a lot of ways. Two years after its inception, the network of open streets crisscrosses all five boroughs, with more to come. Public space is definitely an, an evolving thing. It's not static. It's a constant conversation that is one of our most nimble assets. So we're constantly working with folks in the community to make sure that you know we're meeting their needs in a sufficient way. Going hand in hand with the open streets program is a renewed push to encourage New Yorkers to decrease car usage. But what we've seen increasingly is that people don't necessarily want to drive everywhere. They want to have options. And we want to make it safe and comfortable, whether you want to walk, whether you want to bike, whether you want to take the bus, okay? that we want to deliver a system where people have good choices to get where they need to go. In a city as dense as this one, New Yorkers have a special relationship with the streets. There's an ownership to our streets. I mean, the street isn't just the place where you, you drive to get home. The street is the place that where you live, that you, you know, whether you're walking to the, the corner store, the bodega, you're hanging out with friends, you're walking to the subway, it feels like it is part of your living environment. And you know, there's an intensity to that and, a, and a, a care of that that I think isn't matched elsewhere. It's rewarding. You see a filthy street that you're approaching, once you pass it, you look in the rearview mirror and it's spotless, that's rewarding. In some ways, the streets are just as alive as the people that use them adapting over and over again to changing technologies and conditions. No matter what the future holds for this unique city, the roads will be here in some form or fashion to keep it all running smoothly, mostly.